Matthew 21. 37. They will reverence my son. Strictly speaking, indeed, this thought does not apply to God, for he knew what would happen, and was not deceived by the expectation of a more agreeable result, but it is customary, especially in parables, to ascribe to him human feelings. And yet this was not added without reason, for Christ intended to represent, as in a mirror, how deplorable their impiety was, of which it was too certain a proof that they rose in diabolical rage against the Son of God, who had come to bring them back to a sound mind. As they had formerly, as far as lay in their power, driven God from his inheritance by the cruel murder of the prophets, so it was the crowning point of all their crimes to slay the Son, that they might reign, as in a house which wanted an heir. Certainly the chief reason why the priests raged against Christ was, that, they might not lose their tyranny which might be said to be their prey, for he it is by whom God chooses to govern, and to whom he has given all authority. The evangelists differ also a little in the conclusion. For Matthew relates that he drew from them the confession, by which they condemned themselves, while Mark says simply that Christ declared what punishment must await servants so unprincipled and wicked. Luke differs, at first sight, more openly, by saying that they turned away with horror from the punishment which Christ had threatened. But if we examine the meaning more closely, there is no contradiction, for, in regard to the punishment which such servants deserved, there can be no doubt that they agreed with Christ, but when they perceived that both the crime and the punishment were made to apply to themselves, they deprecated that application. Matthew 21. 42. Have you never read in the scriptures? We must remember what we said a little before, that, as the priests and scribes kept the people devoted to them, it was a principal current among them, that they alone were competent to judge and decide as to the future redemption, so that no one ought to be received as Messiah, unless he were approved and sanctioned by their voice. They therefore maintain that what Christ had said is impossible, that they would slay the son and heir of the proprietor of the vineyard. But Christ confirms his statement by the testimony of Scripture, and the interrogation is emphatic, as if he had said, You reckon it highly absurd to say that it is possible for the vine dressers to conspire wickedly against the Son of God. But what then? Did the Scripture, Psalm 118 hours 22 minutes, foretell that he would be received with joy, and favor, and applause, or did it not, on the contrary, foretell that the rulers themselves would oppose him? The passage which he quotes is taken from the same psalm from which had been taken that joyful exclamation, Save, O Lord! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That it is a prediction of the reign of the Messiah is evident from this consideration, that David was appointed by God to be king, on the condition that his throne would remain forever, so long as the sun and moon would shine in heaven, and that, when decayed, it would again be restored by the favor of God to its former prosperity. Since, therefore, that psalm contains a description of the reign of David, there is also added the perpetuity of it, on which the restoration depends. If the discourse had related to any temporal reign, Christ would have acted improperly in applying it to himself. But we must also observe what sort of reign God raised up in the person of David. It was that which he would establish in the true Messiah to the end of the world, for that ancient anointing was but a shadow. Hence we infer that what was done in the person of David was a prelude and figure of Christ. Let us now return to the words of the psalm. The scribes and priests reckoned it incredible that Christ should be rejected by the rulers of the church. But he proves from the psalm, that he would be placed on his throne by the wonderful power of God, contrary to the will of men, and that this had already been shadowed out in David, whom, though rejected by the nobles, God took to give an instance and proof of what he would at length do in his Christ. The prophet takes the metaphor from buildings, for, since the church is God's sanctuary, Christ, on whom it is founded, is justly called the cornerstone, that is, the stone which supports the whole weight of the building. If one were to examine minutely everything that relates to Christ, the comparison would not apply in every part, but it is perfectly appropriate, for on him the salvation of the church rests, and by him its condition is preserved. 
and therefore the other prophets followed the same form of expression, particularly Isaiah and Daniel. But Isaiah makes the closest allusion to this passage, when he represents God as thus speaking. Lo, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, a precious and elect stone, against which both houses of Israel shall stumble. Isaiah 28 hours 16 minutes. The same mode of expression frequently occurs in the New Testament. The amount of it therefore is, that the kingdom of God will be founded on a stone, which the builders themselves will reject as unsuitable and useless, and the meaning is, that the Messiah, who is the foundation of the safety of the church, will not be chosen by the ordinary suffrages of men, but that, when God shall miraculously raise him up by a secret and unknown power, the rulers, to whom has been committed the care of the building, will oppose and persecute him. There are two things here which we ought to consider. First, that we may not be perplexed by the wicked attempts of men, who rise up to hinder the reign of Christ, God has warned us beforehand that this will happen. Secondly, whatever may be the contrivances of men, God has at the same time declared, that in setting up the kingdom of Christ, his power will be victorious. Though thought to be carefully observed by us. It appears to be monstrous that the author of salvation should be rejected, not by strangers, but by those who belong to his own household, not by the ignorant multitude, but by the rulers themselves, who hold the government of the church. Against such strange madness of men our faith ought to be fortified, that it may not give way through the novelty of the occurrence. We now perceive how useful that prediction is, which relieves godly minds from the terror that would otherwise be produced by the mournful spectacle. For nothing is more unreasonable than that the members should rise up against the head, the vine dressers against the proprietor, the counselors against their king, and that the builders should reject the foundation of the building. That stone is made the head of the corner. Still more emphatic is this clause, in which God declares that the wicked, by rejecting Christ, will avail nothing, but that his rank will remain unimpaired. The design of it is, that believers, relying on that promise, may safely look down with contempt and derision on the wicked pride of men, for when they have made all their contrivances, Christ will still, ill opposition to their wishes, retain the place which the Father has appointed to him. How fiercely soever he may be assailed by those who appear to possess honor and dignity, he will nevertheless remain in his own rank, and will abate nothing on account of their wicked contempt. In short, the authority of God will prevail, that he may be the elect and precious stone, which supports the church of God, his kingdom and temple. The stone is said to be made the head of the corner, not that he is only a part of the building, since it is evident from other passages that the church is entirely founded on him alone, but the prophet merely intended to state that he will be the chief support of the building. Some go into ingenious arguments about the word corner, that Christ is placed in the corner, because he unites two separate walls, the Gentiles and Jews. But in my opinion, David meant nothing more than that the cornerstone supports the chief weight of the building. It may now be asked, how does the Spirit call those men builders, who are so strongly bent on the ruin and destruction of the temple of God? For Paul boasts of having been an honest builder, because he founded the church on Christ alone, 1 Corinthians 3 10, 11, the answer is easy. Though they are unfaithful in the execution of the office committed to them, yet he gives them this title with respect to their calling. Thus the name prophet is often given to deceivers, and those who devour the flock like wolves are called pastors. And so far is this from conferring honor on them, that it renders them detestable, when they utterly overthrow the temple of God, which they were appointed to build. Hence we draw a useful warning, that the lawful calling does not prevent those who ought to have been the ministers of Christ from being sometimes his base and wicked enemies. The legal priesthood had certainly been appointed by God, and the Lord had bestowed on the Levites permission to govern the church. Did they therefore discharge their office faithfully? Or ought the godly to have obeyed them by renouncing Christ? Let the Pope now go with his mitred bishops and let them boast that they ought to be believed in all things, because they occupy the place of pastors. 
even granting that they were lawfully called to the government of the church, yet they have no right to claim anything more than to hold the title of prelates of the church. But even the title of calling does not belong to them, for, in order to raise them to that tyranny, it would be necessary that the whole order of the church should be overturned. And even though they might justly claim ordinary jurisdiction, yet, if they overturn the sacred house of God, it is only in name that they must be reckoned builders. Nor does it always happen that Christ is rejected by those who are entrusted with the government of the church, for not only were there many godly priests under the law, but also, under the reign of Christ, there are some pastors who labor diligently and honestly in building the church, but as it was necessary that this prediction should be fulfilled, that the builders should reject the stone, wisdom must be exercised in distinguishing between them. And the Holy Spirit has expressly warned us, that none may be mistaken as to an empty title or the dignity of calling. This has been done by the Lord, as it is a matter too far removed from the ordinary judgment of men, that the pastors of the church should themselves reject the Son of God from being their prince, the prophet refers it to the secret purpose of God, which, though we cannot comprehend it by our senses, we ought to contemplate and admire. Let us therefore understand, that this cuts short every question, and that every man is expressly forbidden to judge and measure the nature of Christ's kingdom by the reason of the flesh, for what folly is it to wish to subject to the capacity of our mind a miracle which the prophet exhorts us to adore? Will you then receive nothing but what appears to yourself to be probable, in reference to the kingdom of Christ, the commencement of which the Holy Spirit declares to be a mystery worthy of the highest admiration, because it is concealed from the eyes of men? So then, whenever the question relates to the origin, restoration, condition, and the whole safety of the church, we must not consult our senses, but must honor the power of God by admiring his hidden work. There is also an implied contrast between God and men, for not only are we commanded to embrace the wonderful method of governing the church, because it is the work of God, but we are likewise withdrawn from a foolish reverence for men, which frequently obscures the glow of God, as if the prophet had said, that however magnificent may be the titles which men bear, it is wicked in any man to oppose them to God. This furnishes a refutation of the diabolical wickedness of the papists, who do not scruple to prefer to the word of God a decision of their pretended church. For on what does the authority of the word of God depend, according to them, but on the opinion of men, so that no more power is left to God than what the church is pleased to allow him? Far otherwise does the Spirit instruct us by this passage namely, that as soon as the majesty of God appears, the whole world ought to be silent.